Amina Malik Hussain and you're watching The Coffee Table. I'm full of beans today. I suppose I always am. But today we're going to be talking about yoga on The Coffee Table. And it's such a fascinating conversation because yoga is not just what we think it is, which is this sort of um, um, spiritual slash exercise regimen that keeps you light and keeps Madonna looking freakishly young. It's actually <laughs> a really interesting philosophy and, and fascinating way to find balance in one's life. And I'm really excited to be welcoming two wonderfully experienced practitioners on the show, you know, through the internet, unfortunately, but you know, these are the times that we live in. Um, today we have on the show with us uh, Sabah Rana, who is, now this is a really cool acronym, it's an experienced registered yoga teacher. So it's E-R-Y-T. So she is an E-R-Y-T. Uh, she is a Yoga Alliance continued education provider, which is also one of the sort of yoga qualifications that one has, and runs the Soul Space Yoga Studio in Lahore. She has got 200 hours of yoga training, teacher training, YTT in Bali, and is also a meditation facilitator. Fascinating, can't wait. And joining us from Sri Lanka is Shirin Akbar, who teaches at the Lawrence Hill Paradise Ayurveda Centrum and at Earthlings in Hikadua in Sri Lanka. And she also runs her own practice called Lime Tree Yoga. Shirin is also an ERYT and a YACP member. She is a member of the Yoga Alliance of the United States and has over 1,200 hours of yoga teaching under her belt. Welcome to the show, ladies. This is super exciting. <laughs> so, Saba, let's start with you. Um, when we talk about yoga and we talk about being trained to teach yoga and, and we have these alliances and we have these qualifications, so what does it mean, for example, to be part of the Yoga Alliance? Okay, so uh, basically the Yoga Alliance is a nonprofit organization um, and there's several of them. There's one based in the United States, there's one in India, one in Europe. And being part of the Yoga Alliance, whether you are 200 hours or you've got an additional 300 hours, you register yourself with the World Yoga Alliance and you are internationally qualified to huh. teach anywhere. No, that's really interesting and I'm kind of beginning with that because I th a lot of times people see yoga as this kind of new age, kind of, you know, hippy-dippy thing to do, but it's actually a, a sort of a process and, and, an act, and an activity that has, that is monitored, that has regulations, that is done a specific way. Like you can't just sort of one day decide that, well, you know, I'm just going to teach yoga and then just do it. There's a great deal of training involved. Oh, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Um, the the initial training, it consists of 200 hours. Mm. And those 200 hours are usually in a setting of intense training, whereby you're waking up at five in the morning with the sunrise, mm. you're going through a, a silence meditative process. And then there's yeah. pranayama, which are breathing techniques being taught to you. So the whole day is fully booked up. There's pranayama, there's asana practice, which is very... Uh, very uh, physically enduring and it's mm -hmm. and it's you know it's uh, you've got to have courage to actually go through it and it's such an, a fascinating experience to go through at a personal level too uh -huh. Uh -huh. so um the whole day you go through and yeah, you're usually on a vegetarian diet you're mm -hmm. caffeine free you're take, you know you're you're maximizing on the benefits at a personal level as yeah. well yeah. and of course then there's the philosophy training and the anatomy and all of that the it's an intense training. You go to literally by the time it's 9 p.m., uh, you have maybe an hour or so to get your homework done and off to bed you go. And then oh, it's uh, early morning. So it's three three weeks of intense, mm -hmm. rigorous training. Mm -hmm. And sort of having to do work on no caffeine sounds like a challenge in itself. <laughs> you know, I'm just like... <laughs> so... I'm really glad that you brought up the the philosophy, the, the sort of the meditation involved and the homework involved, and and because it's yoga is not just a physical um, activity. It's also there's a whole entire philosophy behind it. And and she didn't. You you live in Sri Lanka right now, and you and you teach at these various places. And so what is it? So 
Okay, let's start at the beginning. So I want to talk about the philosophy behind yoga because it's an incredibly ancient practice that is deeply rooted in a South Asian cultural tradition. Yes, um, it's um, it came came about in the South Indian uh, subcontinent. It's the aesthetic strand of of philosophy where you kind of go inwards and. Um, see what's happening within yourselves. Um, the most famous one, I'll just, there's a lot of philosophy, different strands, but one is the Patanjali, the eight limb of yes. uh, Patanjali. Hmm. And uh, the eight limbs, very quickly, we don't want to waste time. And Sabha, please do correct me at any time or put in your bit. One is the ya Yamas, which is your social conduct, hmm. you know, non-stealing, hmm. not your neighbors, and then you have the niyamas, which is your yourself, your own uh, personal studying, keeping clean, you know, clean, clean, mm -hmm. uh, clean thoughts. Mm -hmm. So you have the yamas and niyamas, which are your social and personal conducts. And then okay. you come to the asanas. Mm -hmm. So that is what most people think of yoga is asanas. But yes. as we now know more, it's not just the postures, asana being, being the postures. Hmm. Then you have pranayama, which is your next step. And then you have pratyaha, which is the withdrawal. So when you take away all your sensory, um, hmm. Hmm. your feelings, your sense of sight, you start going inwards. Then you have, um, then you have the meditation that comes in, the dharana, and then eventually samadhi, uh, you know, which is your union where you kind of lose the me, the ego. Hmm and you're in another space. Hmm. Now, I find that fascinating. And also because there are different, yoga is used in different kinds of belief practices as well. So there's obviously when I, I think when one thinks of yoga, the first one that comes to mind is like Vedic or Hindu, uh, you know, religious practice. But then there's also Buddhist. Yoga is used in by Buddhists and Jains also. And they all have their own kind of slightly different approach to the practice as well, because from what I understand, for example, you know, um, Buddhist yoga, I got my notes, um, this sort of idea of achieving awakening and nirvana is so, sort of cessation of that outside noise and to kind of find that kind of complete peace. Or with Jain yoga, it's about purifying and, and liberating the soul. But isn't that that's so fascinating that all of these practices are using this one um, so is it different sort of in Buddhist yoga or Jain yoga or Hindu yoga? Are the sort of um, approaches slightly different because the outcome is a little different? There's different approaches, obviously, but ah. um, it's not a Hindu or a Buddhist. It was an aesthetic okay. strand which was taken hmm. into the tapestry. Huh. There is no such thing really as Hindu religion. Um, and you talk about Vedism, that's also just part of... Um, the Hindu, it's a tapestry and, huh. you know, it's not just like one religion, like we have the Abrahamic religions yes. of, you know, hmm. Islam and Judaism. It's much more, um, it's like the soil of a jungle. There's a lot of strands interlaced. And um, yes, I think it's about delving within and being free of the outer world and the outer attachments. Let's just keep it simple, you know, I yeah. think, and going yeah. in. And, you know, sort of withdrawing from outside attachments and uh, finding some sort of happiness, you know, the mysteries mm. of life mm. and sort of going within and finding it within yourself. Hmm. Hmm. No, I think that's really beautiful. And I really like the, the idea of it being like the soil of the jungle, that it's a practice that is for everyone. And it doesn't really have to be attached to any one kind of, of spiritual practice. And it can, it's something that, it, everybody benefits from being able to kind of access this inner voice and this inner and this ability to detach from the outside outside noise. Sabha, what do you think? You know, I just uh, I want to add to what Shireen said, and Shireen, you put it really, really well. And to 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 actually tell you about all the yamas and niyamas, it yeah. really is the essence of yoga, because mm. a lot of people think it's just about the physical practice. Yeah. 
I, what I want to add here is that I think we, l- we look at yoga as a lifestyle because mm. it kind of gives you a lens through which yeah. you can look at yourself and understand your role in this life a little better with the purpose. So yeah. it, you begin to live a more sort of sort of a meaningful life mm. and awakened life. A mindful uh, way of living is what yoga is bringing to the table, not just mm. a set of exercises, yes. so to say. So yeah. living yoga yoga when we say living yoga on the mat and off the mat that's what we mean because it gives you a set of very useful and practical tools whereby you can begin to live more present more grounded quite right and it's really interesting because when i was reading up about yoga i was really surprised to learn that the yoga that w- that the practice that we call yoga today is actually hatha yoga and there's so many different kinds and and that kind of hatha yoga was sort of a late 19th century early 20th century kind of interpretation of of the practice that some indians took to the west and then that's the sort of yoga culture that that developed from there when actually like you said saba is actually a philosophy and it's a way of living and it's really it's a Tell me how the asanas are actually just one part. Like the, there seems to be a lot of emphasis now in a sort of modern yoga practice on the postures. But then there's so many other things around it, which are equally, if not, some people say it's actually more important than the asanas. Personally, I feel, and of course, Shireen can add her view as well, because she's she's got so much more experience and she's been around a lot longer than I am. I actually feel like the pranayama, which mm-hmm. is the breath, prana comes from yeah. the Sanskrit word prana, life force, mm-hmm. and yama is to learn to retain, retention. So okay. the pranayama practice of learning to m- maneuver our breath so that we can manage our emotional state is the game changer. Mm. I feel like the the emphasis is a lot more on how to breathe because the breath is how we're going to control our our nervous system and we're going to calm the nerves. There's so much high anxiety level these days. Yes, there is. Especially in the digital world, right? Mm -hmm. So that the what I think the biggest game changer and takeaway from yoga these days is the pranayama techniques Mm. and of course we are now beginning to realize the importance of meditation the guided Uh meditations that come along with it i hate to interrupt but we're going to take a very quick break and come back to talk more about pranayama stay with us Welcome back to The Coffee Table. We're having such a fascinating conversation on yoga with Yogini Sabarana and Shireen Akbar. Yes, Shireen, tell me more. We've been talking about pranayama before the break, and I know you have something to tell me. <laughs> well, you were asking about the asanas. Where yes. the asana comes in is, I've lost you again. I'm speaking to myself, but that's fine. The asana is postural work, and why are they... They're not so important as they're made up to be now, but they're important mm. just to make yourself comfortable in your body. Because okay. if you're not comfortable mm-hmm. in your body, then how can you breathe comfortably or see or sit anywhere or, yeah. you know, continue your life? So yeah. asana was actually there so you could out, stretch out, give more lung space, so you would be more comfortable than uh, to do your breathing exercise or even mm-hmm. just to live your life more comfortably. Yeah. And also, also because, you know, everything is interconnected. I imagine that if you are doing the asanas correctly, you are kind of being able to expand your body to receive the breath better. So if you're sort of your posture is correct, you're breathing properly, then the kind of the, the effects of pranayama work will be more profound. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm going to ask you a question, Meena. Where's your permanent residence? Here in Lahore. <laughs> Think again. Oh, I know. It's here in my body. <laughs> it's in your body. This is the one place that we have. And I just want to stress, and I'm taking this forum, you know, this is the one place that is permanently with you. Mm. And we need to take care of it physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. And yoga is the tool. Yoga in all its aspects, whether living a clean life Mm. or doing a bit of exercise or eating correctly, whatever it is. So this is the one place. This is the only place. 
That's really beautiful. I can't believe that my first response to your question was to kind of think of geography <laughs> and not my place in that geography. Wow. So, so, so you didn't tell me about your your journey to to yoga. Well, you met me, met me when I had just started about eleven years ago, as uh, when I gave birth to my son in Lahore. I'm not from Lahore originally, from Karachi. So, um, yes, apart from the baby group where we met, the other thing that just kept me busy was going to my yoga class um, just soon after birth because I was always into sports. I was a polo player before, but that wasn't happening. So I had to find some way yeah. to, to move. <laughs> and uh, I was in yoga classes, and although I had been exposed to yoga previously in my 30s, but by the age of 41 when I had Enzo, I said, this really felt right. It felt right in my body, in my mind, in my spirit, and it was it was the game changer. I think at that time, um, it was the time for yoga to come into my life, not before. Some people, it's earlier. I wish I lived in India. I never took one lesson, and, um, and here I am now. No, but that that's really beautiful. I think because not everybody is able to do this. So, Sabha, tell me about your journey because I'm so interested in people's journeys because we all kind of start in one place, but some people make it to other places. And I feel like yoga is one is really kind of helps to kind of change the way we also sort of interact with the world, but also ourselves and our own thoughts. You know, I love what you just said, Meena, because it relates to me perfectly. Mm. For me, uh, mm. yoga has been extremely transformational. Yeah. For me, it's been a complete 180 degree turn in my life in terms of how I lived, what I believed, uh, what mm. my perception was, how my, what my emotional state was, everything around me. So my journey with body movement, though, began very early because as yeah. a child, I was a gymnast, in yes. fact. And, and a very I good one that I, I was actually something drawn I was drawn to the body movement I knew mm. it was something that's really gonna align my soul to my mind and my body I knew that at a very early age mm. and it was something that I had a love affair with throughout my life I kept coming back to it because then life took over and practicality took over and yes. logic took over As and it does. making money and all of that rat race came about mm. yes unfortunately or not unfortunately because it was a learning experience for me to actually come full circle to connecting back to my original passion, which was the body and the movement. Yeah. And then I played with um, being an aerobic instructor in my 20s. And then I uh, opened up a dance studio and I played with that for a bit. And eventually for me, it became a lot about the spiritual journey because I was I found myself very lost when it came to the soul. And there were so many questions that were unanswered and so many areas of my life that had a vacuum, right? At a personal level, at work mm. level, so many mm. different levels. Mm. And yoga for me became the, the catalyst for that immense transformation. It, it really, really gave me that support and answered and connected the dots in so many ways. Yeah. So I, I am, uh, I would say, fairly new to yoga because I I went for my teacher training five years ago mm. and when I when I came back I just literally stopped everything else and I just said you know what I just absolutely want to dedicate my time and energy to this so I began very small in a very small room in my house with two clients and I just built it up from there and mashallah it's just been um, the the universal flow from there just opened up all kinds of channels and changed things for me in in more ways that you can imagine. So it. for me, it's that. it's it's been fantastic. I love that. And this, of course, it is when we talk about pranayama, and I sort of come back to it because it's really the the life force or the energy that runs through the universe. And energy is real. And even if one didn't sort of believe in it in a spiritual way, it's even science. You know, there's energy in everything, and energy is moving around and and yoga is this sort of way to harness it so she didn't tell me i know that bo both you and sabha practice different there are different kinds of yoga as well so we've been talking about hatha but then there's also <laughs> I got my notes again there's also yin and there's ashtanga and there's vinyasa so how are all of these different what's the difference 
I think that just um, I don't want to go into full details. You know, it's a bit. I'm curious. <laughs> but um, no, they're just different expressions. They're just different expressions of of of, of a path. Um, hmm. They a lot of the postures would be very basic and the same. How they're put together, how they are uh, experienced, maybe different. How they're taught. Hmm. So the, the, those are the differences, the basic, you know, if you go, to, you say Hatha Yoga Ashtanga, but Ashtanga has a lot of, has the Hatha Yoga postures in it, how it's developed and how it's uh, sequenced may, you know, may be different, how it's taught, maybe the breath hmm. work involved. So, um, so they're just the different expressions of the path and, you know, it'll, every, every yoga style will call out to some. To different people, so you might like Hatha. Somebody will like something else because it just speaks to them differently. So if one, is, ha, so if one is sort of doing yoga, is it is it um, uh, is it good to kind of talk to your instructor and ask them if one can try out different ways of doing it to see what suits you best? I I think best is just to go to different classes and see uh, what style and what teacher. Often enough, it's the teacher. That uh, that inspires students. I think mm. uh, Saba. I don't know. I'm sure Saba will have something to say. But I think you need to try different uh, styles, different teachers. Hmm. Just go and see. Don't just say, "Oh, I didn't like this class." Try try another class if that's possible. And then and then see what what feels good within you. What gives you that satisfaction when you walk out of the class? So I won't say one's better than the other. There is no such thing. Ah, interesting. Something I'm curious about, like you teach in Sri Lanka and of course there are so many um, um, yoga retreats in India as well and it's a sort of really, and I'm sure obviously in other South Asian countries, you know, Indonesia and things. Clearly this is an ancient practice that is kind of part of the fabric of this region, but why, why isn't it more common? for more people to be practicing it. And I'm just sort of thinking about Pakistan, for example, because we're, we are part of this region and historically we are just as, you know, it's just as ancient as anybody else. So I'm sort of wondering where that gap, why that gap exists, if there is one. Well, I think Sri Lanka is a bit like Pakistan. It's not so widely practiced here mm -hmm. either. Mm -hmm. Like in Pakistan, there are studios and all, but it's not yeah. commonly practiced. I except in different studios and maybe, you know, more in Colombo or with uh, tourists that come in. But let's talk about Pakistan generally um, because of our education. Number one, we're not even into sports. True. People have no body awareness. Absolutely. You know, women are not playing sports in school. Men hardly. It's not promoted. So already body awareness is not there. Hmm, hmm. which is already so important, some sort of, you know, physical awareness. So that's already not there. Plus we have our uh, religion that uh, is obviously, as a lot of people think it's Hindu uh, thing, yoga, which is not because it's not a religion. It's, no, it's, it's not. a philosophy. It's a way of life. Hmm. So that also um, plays an impact. So I think these are the two things. We're not a sporty nation. We're not promoting any kind of physical activity in schools. Hmm. The other thing is the religious aspect. Yeah. Maybe yeah. Sabah has something. But... Quite right. And, and did, so Sabah, tell me more about why is it so important to be aware of the body? Now, whether you're playing sports or doing yoga or any kind of sort of physical practice, why is it important to be aware of your body? Okay, so coming back to what Shireen said when yes. she asked you where your permanent residence is, I would go back to that point. This is a body, the vessel that is given to us on this earth journey, which is housing our soul, our emotional journey, our feelings, everything, right? Yes. So how do we take care of that? We're taking care of our mind, we're reading books, we're gaining knowledge, we're taking care of our soul by being spiritual. Some people want to call it religion, some people want to call it um, man mantras, tasbis, whatever you want to yeah. call that, right? A personal journey. How do you take care of the body? By moving it, by allowing it to breathe, by allowing it to connect to your inner um, soul and mind by uniting it all together. If we're not going to respect the body by watching what we're, what nutrients are going into it, 
by making sure it's getting, uh, you know, organic, as organic as you can, food as possible. Yeah. That is why it's important. And another thing I want to add, Mina, to what you and Shreen were talking about earlier about why yoga isn't being practiced widely. I completely 100 hmm. percent agree with what Shreen said. Um, the, the, the connotation that it's uh, attached to Hinduism and that I was born in India mm. has a lot to do, has had a lot to do with it in the past. Yeah. Now I feel a lot of it is changing. So I have a different view. I feel very, very, very positive because when I came back after my training in, five years ago and I started teaching, there were very few teachers who had gone for a yoga teacher training who had even considered the career of a yoga teacher. Yeah. as an entity on its yes. own. I think that's changed very quickly. I think there's been a boom in Pakistan and a lot of people are becoming very aware, very knowledgeable about what yoga is, their attitude towards the breath work, towards the body, towards the meditations is absolutely amazing. People are opening up to the spiritual awakening of it all that it's offering. So people are not viewing it as the lighthearted exercise that yes. yoga used to be in people's mind earlier. So I'm feeling really good about the spread and the speed of it now in Pakistan, actually. That's wonderful. And, I'm, and a lot hmm. of young girls coming, uh -huh. coming back with their teacher trainings and taking it on full swing, which is great. That is. And it's really, it fills me with hope. But Sabha, what do you think, what do you think has happened to kind of cause this change? Do you think it's because people who have been practicing yoga so, so, you know, other people can see the benefits of it. Or do you think that as a sort of, even globally, we are realizing how increasingly disconnected we are from our spiritual selves. And there is a desire generally to kind of try and reconnect with that. And like you mentioned purpose before in our conversation. And I thought that that was something that, you know, stood out for me as sort of having a sense of purpose and a sense of meaning that's also outside of duty. Sort of, you know, we have this cultural idea that this is your duty and this is what you're supposed to do. But you also have a duty to yourself. And I feel like that's something that we all neglect a lot. I think you're you're right, Mina. It's a bit of both. It's two things, I would hmm. say. One is the, the global necessity of bringing the stress level down because there's so much screen time. We're living in a digital age and uh, world and, at the moment. And of course, adding to that has been this whole COVID process. Yes. And the other thing is people realizing the, the importance of finding your purpose, the meaning behind this, this very life, this very journey. Mm. So that it's filling up a lot of that vacuum and a lot of those answers for so many people. And then it's becoming a, a word of mouth thing as well, because you're seeing so many people um, becoming a lot more blissful, a lot more peaceful, a lot mm. more living a, a, me a meaningful life. And that, that's a very contagious thing for anyone to realize, right? <laughs> I like so, that. Yeah. I like calling it contagious. <laughs> yeah. you know, it's such a good disease to catch, you know. I want to be peaceful and mindful of my you know, awareness and my place in the universe. That's a good thing to catch. We're going to take a very quick break here. We'll be back in a flash. Stay with us. Welcome back to the coffee table. We've been having a riveting conversation about the philosophy of yoga with yoginis Sabarana and Shirin Akbar. So Shirin, in, you know, in the beginning of the show, uh, you talked about how meditation it goes sort of hand in hand with a yoga practice. So tell me more about meditation. Like, What's the process and why is it important? How does it reinforce the things that yoga teaches us? Firstly, meditation is not necessary. It's not necessary to sit down in meditation. Huh. Keep it very simple. Let's take away the meditation word and say awareness. Ah, I interesting. think the number one step in life is about awareness. Hmm. About becoming just aware where you are, what you're thinking, what you're saying. So the number one thing is awareness. So yoga as a tool, even in asana practice, you start forgetting what's happening outside and you're mm. just becoming aware of your body. Maybe then you become aware of your breath. For example, new practitioners will be busy adjusting the bodies. Maybe they'll forget about the breath, but then you bring them back to their breath awareness. So I think 
putting just med the word meditation aside, let's talk about awareness, hmm. staying in the moment, <laughs> feeling what you're feeling, accepting without judging. And that is the beginning of the process of, of, uh, of meditation. Of course, you've got meditators and people, you know, who sit the traditional way and mm. um, which a lot of us do at the end of class maybe. But I think to start with is just being present, being aware where you are. So if I'm talking to you, I am talking to you, Mina. I am not thinking, what am I going to cook in five minutes, in another half an hour? Mm. So... No, the word a, awareness no. is the key, no, is I the think key word here, yeah, is yeah. just being present. Huh. And do you think that, you know, on one level it sounds simplistic to say that, you know, be aware of your surroundings and your thoughts and your feelings, because a lot of people might be like, well, I'm perfectly aware of that. I know what's happening around me. But it's not as simple as it sounds. And is it something that one has to kind of keep practicing for it to start happening in a more natural way? Do you find that in your students, for example? Of course, absolutely, because it's a practice, it's a tool. So when they're on the mat, we as teachers or facilitators, I would say, mm. you get them to tune in and to start experiencing things and guiding them without really telling them always what they're supposed to feel or do. I mean, there are three mm -hmm. rhythms in our body. Let me just put it this way. You've got the rhythm of your heart, uh -huh. the rhythm of your breath, mm -hmm. and the rhythm of your mind. And I have lost oh, here. Oh, so heart, breath, mind. Yeah, three. Oh, wow. Mind. Hmm. So what happens is sometimes our minds are somewhere else, the breath is somewhere else, and the heart, the heart is somewhere else. So hmm. I am maybe teaching my class, but I've got to worry or I need to cook for tomorrow's dinner, so I'm not there. So there is a disconnect. Huh. So yoga, what, what yoga does is try to bring these three rhythms to synchronize, to be more together. Hmm. Hmm. And, and do that, you need to be more aware. If you're not aware, then how are you going to, are you going to bring them uh, closer together? That's true. And then perhaps one, for example, was focusing on the breath, then that would help bring the mind into sort of alignment. And then when those two are aligned, then the, the heart follows. So I imagine it's obviously something that happens over time. And then, you know, sometimes one thing is in place, but the two other ones aren't. And you just have to kind of keep at it. And become aware of that. That's fine. Fine. We all, as even when we practice meditation, hmm. our minds do go. They do take off. It's so just about training the mind to come back, being aware. Oh, my mind's gone off thinking about tonight's party. Let's just come back and focus. So it's totally normal, and it happens to everybody. And there's <laughs> the key of awareness. Oh, my mind's taken off. Let's bring it back <laughs> to the mat and to the practice or to the cooking, if you're meditating while cooking. Concentrate on the food, get your mind there and don't think of something else. That again is a form of meditation too. Really wonderful because again, one of those things when people think of meditation, the thing that you're sitting in a sort of a quiet room that is very, and you're wearing white and you're just sort of sitting and sort of, you know, it's very zen, but I love the idea that awareness is something that you can practice at any time during the day and you can try and make it a sort of almost like a constant state. And so, so Sabah, why, why is it important to have this connectedness? Because I imagine that it probably cycles back to feeling more present in your body and feeling more kind of anchored to reality, if, if that's a correct way to put it. Absolutely. Um, I want to add to what Shireen said. Yes. It makes perfect sense. She said she's talking about awareness. Mm. So um, all of these um, uh, uh, avenues of yoga, the eight mm. limbs that she's talking about, mm. including the asana practice, the pranayama, the meditation, all of these, even the kriyas, which mm. are different cleansing techniques, ah. um, all of us do the same thing they're all helping us become more aware and present in what we're doing so when you ask the question of explaining what meditation is it's simply becoming aware of the thoughts in our monkey mind as we call it right yeah. so when, so when we it. become aware of the mind the that hops mind, around <laughs> Huh. Absolutely, because that is what's, what the culprit is. It's constantly telling us to stress, to think about the future, to live in the past. 
and it makes us forget what we're doing in the present moment. Like mm. Shreem said, if you're cooking, be all there, smell the fragrance, uh, take a look at what you're cutting with your hands, be aware of every little movement, right? Mm. So all of these practices are making us aware of the present moment. When we're sitting down, for example, like you said, in the white clothes and in the quiet spot, and we're meditating, we are simply observing as a third person what the monkey mind is doing. If the thoughts arise, we keep mm. coming back to observing our breath. We keep coming back to observing the alignment of our body. All of these are very simple techniques just to remind us to be in the present moment, to be aware of our five senses, the smell, the touch, the taste, the sound, all of that, right? It mm. brings us back. These are all yogic senses. These are all elements that bring us back to it. And, and then the other thing being, as Shireen said in the beginning, that meditation is not just literally sitting down when you see all these yogis levitating and in, in, yeah. in, in a <laughs> sukhasana. Not at all. Meditation can be riding, can be dancing can be reading can be just a nature walk anything mm. that you enjoy doing being aware is making it into meditation as opposed to just doing it half-heartedly yeah i think that's wonderful and then so much more accessible as well because i think a lot of times people are skeptical of these practices because they think that it's a huge effort to do and that only a few people can do it and you know this it's not for me but i'm also this conversation is making me think of a line from T.S. Eliot, and he talks about being the still point in a turning world. And I feel like now our lives and the world is sort of turning faster and faster, and we're just kind of being spun around with it. And it's becoming even more important to find a still point within ourselves also, where, where then we can sort of you know, proceed and then sort of go into the world from a place that is calmer, and, and and kinder to ourselves also. It's it's a healing process. And it's very it's very therapeutic, Mina. I yeah. find a lot of people do get scared of it too, because it's almost like going to a therapist. Mm. And then it's it's like bringing up emotions and bringing up things that you might have just like tucked under the rug very nicely, mm. perhaps. So it is like being in therapy. A lot of times I have clients and students walking into my studio and they're coming in for fitness they're coming in just because yoga is a fad right yeah but they yeah. walk away with so much more because they've tapped into a, a deep level of emotions a deep level of healing and a lot of mm. times they come back and they're like oh my god you know we're feeling all of this stuff and some of them are cursing me too hell i'm glad <laughs> that they are because it started a process for them <laughs> it's, it's planted that seed. Yeah, sort of. The, you know, you came <laughs> for healing. abs and you got healing instead. But I'm glad that you brought. <laughs> I'm glad that you brought up healing because Shirin, I understand that you do uh, trauma workshops as well, uh, trauma sensitive workshops, and then that's also, I think, a really interesting thing to to kind of think of meditation and yoga as a way of healing trauma as well. Yeah, because. I would say, and I'm sure Sabah will agree, that most people come with some form of trauma. Hmm. It could be on any kind of trauma. It doesn't have to be necessarily sexual. It can be physical, emotional. Something happened to you. Um, you did something, whatever. There's hmm. different kinds of trauma, but a lot of people come with some form. It can be for family trauma. There's so many different kinds of trauma. and. Um, as teachers, I think we just need to be aware of that. And so I had done a workshop and um, so that a lot of people, we don't know what's going on with a lot of our students and yoga being a tool. Sometimes things come out and you begin to read people as well. And um, people who are, um, who suffer of PSTD, of course, mm -hmm. those who carry on that with Sometimes they have to be dealt if you know, and often enough it comes out somewhere, you feel it. Um, they need to be just, you know, maybe they don't need to be touched hmm. or they're not aware of their body. So yoga is a great tool where they start becoming aware of their body, of their feelings um, in a safe space. This gives them a space where, because usually there's a disconnect with PTSD. Hmm. There's ah. a disconnect in all the the heart, the mm. breath, and the mind is, you know, it's a total disconnect. So yoga is a tool where they can slowly, slowly try to reconnect because 
coming from a yogic uh, perspective, we are whole, we are not broken. Ah, then no, that's really beautiful. Do you find that a lot of people carry trauma and, and are not even aware of the fact that they have it? Because I feel like that might be true for a lot of people in this part of the world. Correct. And that's why, why most people at one stage practicing yoga will let out the tears and the knots will open in the body because we hold our pain in our body. I think mm. doctors know that. Now yeah. it's known universally. 85% of disease is mind-borne. Okay. Wow. So uh, we, we carry every thought comes into our body. And just yoga is a tool. Just imagine us as computers. Yeah. If you don't have a firewall, if you don't have an antivirus, then your computer will collapse. And the same with humans. We need to be able to put these systems in place where we can also not just pile up the files and the everything that comes onto us and be able to yeah. see through all of that. So it's a self-care tool as well, yoga. It becomes no. a... Yeah. One of the greatest self-care tools there is out there, and it's free. And it's free. Look at that. Like it's so, and it's so accessible. Anybody can do it. And I feel that the point, the thing that you just said about carrying pain in our bodies is something that I don't think a lot of us consider. And 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 I think that that also kind of connects us back to a general cultural sort of horror. <laughs> of being in touch with one's body. I feel like a lot of our efforts are spent in repressing our bodies and hiding our bodies and controlling what our bodies do and never talking about it, that we're just kind of piling these, well, trauma, really, trauma upon trauma, and then just saying, just sort of, you know, shoving it in the closet and saying, okay, well, you know, never mind that. When a bus somewhere, heart attack, cancer, hmm. any form, most forms of disease is just your piled up stress. Wow. The piled up emotions that are not mm. dealt with. And yoga, that's where yoga comes in. It's just the tool where it makes you more aware. You maybe can deal with things. You're, I mean, I'll just give you my personal experience. Just recently, a uh. couple of nights, I, I got a bit of an... I never used to suffer of anxiety. I got an anxiety, I would say, kind of an attack. Um. It wasn't in the mind, but my body, there was a kind of a pain in the chest, the chest and I recognized mm. that. Mm. I did a breath work because different breath works like yeah. medicine huh. can help to heal something that's happening in your body. Yeah. So, you know, I'm just giving you a bit of a, my personal recent experience. So I did a lot of uh, left nostril because the left nostril activates the right side of the brain, ah. which is the calming aspect. Oh. So if you're feeling anxious, then you can breathe through your nostril and maybe, you know, the anxiety will go down. Oh, so sort of as a little exercise. So this is my left nostril. So if, if I sort of shut my right nostril and then breathe through my left, that's how to do it? You can activate the right side of your brain in that manner, yes. Oh, wow. And by doing that... It's all that, science now. Even the, even the, yeah. I love that's it. That's what it the does. yogis knew thousands of years ago. Yeah, and it's science and the yogis have known it. <laughs> I love that. So if you're sort of breathing through your left nostril, you're activating the right side of your brain and you can help deal with anxiety like that. You can, it, it helps you to calm down. Wow, I love that. I just learned something new <laughs> on this show. It's, it's a real gift. <laughs> thank you so much, Sheen, and thank you so much, Saba, for joining me today on this show. It's been a wonderfully instructive conversation about this ancient practice that really belongs to everybody. And like Sheen said, it's free. You can practice on your own. You can find a teacher. Um, you know, it's just a wonderful tool to help you understand yourself and to help you deal with the numerous things that are making us anxious and making us disconnected from ourselves and you know people around us and why shouldn't we all be happier and healthier and more grounded i think it's wonderful <laughs> thank you all for watching if you're watching this on youtube don't forget to like and subscribe and i will see you next time on the coffee table bye now <laughs>